But I just sense, you know, um, it's been over a year, I think, since we've been here. Uh, but I just have to say, you guys have gone to an another level. You guys, have, I don't know, you don't, sometimes you don't, you don't realize it when you're in it all week and every week. But when you, when you go away and come back, you can tell. There, there's, it's, you guys stepped into promotion. There's, there's, a, there's a, a new level of glory that's here. Uh, there's an increase of angelic activity and an increase of the presence of God, and it's very notable. And so I just want I, just, I have to say that, you know. So uh, the Lord is very pleased with you guys and what you are doing here. And again, we're, we're happy to be here. <clears throat> so anyway, I felt like the Lord wanted me to talk today uh, I don't know if I talk or I preach or I, I don't know what I do, but whatever it is, I'm going to do it. <clears throat> but um, I feel like the Lord wanted me to talk to you today about the, the two greatest commandments, which is the love anointing. And this is very, very important for anybody that's going anywhere. If you're, you're going to go into increase, if you're going to go even higher, how many know there's, there's so many levels of glory that we have not tapped into yet. But what's going to get us there, and the only thing that can get us there, is the love anointing. It's so, it's so true. You know, there's, there's nothing else that can get us to that place, that high place, really high place. And so, but you guys are going there. You guys have already gone higher, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you, you're going even higher. Uh, so uh, Jesus, in Matthew 22, uh, 34 through 40, <clears throat> um, was, was, uh, was asked a question by a Pharisee, and his question was, uh, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your, and all your mind. And this is the first and the greatest commandment. Come on. And then he says, And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on to say, All the law, and, and the prophets hang on these two commands. There's nothing more important than these two commands. Love the Lord your God first, but then also love your neighbor, love your brother, love your sister. And, 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 and they go hand in hand. You know, um, and this is so important. You know, one of, the, one of the greatest indicators that we are growing in our, our, relation, our relationship with God is, is found in our willingness to love. And so um, you've got you to understand love is, is more than an emotion. It's more than a concept. You know, um, uh, the Bible says God is love. God, uh, love is a person. Got to think about that. Love is a person. So uh, love is not something that God does. It's something that he is. And so, uh, and we are never more godly and never more like God than when we, um, when we choose to love. How many of you know love is a choice? It's not an automatic. It's a choice. And, and we need to choose to love. Uh, and so we cannot fulfill the first commandment to love God without obeying the second commandment to love our neighbor. And so if anyone says, in 1 John 4.20 says, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Did you know that? Let that just sink in. And then he goes on to say, and he has given us this commandment. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And so as Christians, this is not optional. And this is so important. If we're going to make a difference in these end times, we have to have the love anointing. God is love. What does love look like? And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So, so important. I know there's people that rub you wrong. There's people, you, know, you don't know my neighbor. <laughs> or that guy at work, you know. 
But I'm going to show you some examples here of love in action and how Jesus loved. And love actually changes people. When you, you know, you get mad at people, that won't change them. But if you begin to love them, this is going to radically change them and turn them around. Because that's what Jesus did. And he's in us. And if we, if we truly love him, and his love resides in us, we can't help but love others. And when we represent him well and love others, he's, the, the anointing increases. The glory increases. The effectiveness in your life will, will go through the roof. So, who is your neighbor? Well, Jesus tells us in Luke 10. I know you guys are all familiar, familiar with this, but let me just read it too for because it's the word of God and it never gets old Luke chapter 10 and verse 30 okay It's not verse 30. Is that verse 25? Anyway, on, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Isn't that amazing? People test Jesus. If, you know, if they test Jesus, guess what? They're going to test you. Get ready for that. It's normal. That's normal, Christian. You will be tested. I, I've been tested this year. You know, I'm the director of the healing rooms over, over, uh, over two nations. You know, and I, I went through a lot this year. But you know what? I'm grateful I did because I've come out the other side. And I'm much stronger. And I have way more compassion. And I, have, I feel like I, I've got way more anointing for, for the miraculous because of what I went through. And I, and, and, but you know what? The Lord has healed me. And uh, boy, the devil tried to take me out. 2023 has been uh, an amazing year. You know, I've never been sick in my life, you know, and, uh, but this year, it's been a crazy year. You know, the first, uh, in, in January, the first message that the Lord gave me for the year, he said this. He said, this is a year of war, a year of warfare, and I'm teaching the church how to war not from a place of def defense, but a place of offense. Right. Amen. And he gave, began to give me a series on that. The very next week, I got hit. And I was um, in the hospital, what, three times? Four times? Five times? I can't remember. Seven times, I think. Altogether, uh, in the hospital. Uh, had three ambulance rides. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, I, I've had, I had three surgeries, uh, never been sick, never been in the hospital. You know, I mean, it's just, I always, I always lived in, in divine health, and you never know. Uh, but through this, the Lord is teaching us how, how to fight. And again, I think in the, in the past, we're always uh, on the defense side, you know. But it's, God is switching that around, and we're going to go after the devil. We're, 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 you know, we're an army. We're the end-time army. And so, uh, but God is waking us up to, to know that. And so we get tested. And so I was tested. But I'm here today. <laughs> I, I, I think I passed the test. <laughs> so where was I? The, uh, where was I? Did I read it? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, who distracted me? Yeah. Okay, anyway, yes, and then so, um, so Jesus says, um, what is written in the law? He replied, and how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, 
and love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, Jesus says, yes, you've, you've answered correctly. And then Jesus replied, but he, um, he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, uh, and who, who is my neighbor? Okay, that's the part I was going to get to. <laughs> a little, little confused. I was, I was verse 30, doggone it. And so uh, Jesus replied. Don't you like it when Jesus replies? <laughs> he said, a man was going down uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and then he fell into the hands of, of robbers, and they, they stripped him of his clothes, and they beat him, and, and went away, leaving him um, uh, half dead. A priest uh, uh, happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw, saw him, he also passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, and he went to him, uh, bandaged his wounds, pour, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey uh, and took him to an inn and took care of him. And, uh, and took care of him. Then the next day he did, took out two silver coins and gave it to the innkeeper. And he says, "Look after him," uh, he said. And I, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may ha you may have. And then Jesus says, "Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers?" And uh, the expert in the law replied, and I love the experts, you know, <laughs> they're always trying to trap you. <clears throat> he said, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So anyway, um, so what we see here is um, uh, Jesus makes the world our neighbor. Uh, by qualifying anyone God puts in our path. It's not just our neighborhood. It's anyone and everyone God puts in our path. And we need to be aware of that. Um, and this has everything to do with the love anointing. And so, so again, what, is, what does love look like? You know, love looks like Jesus. You know, Jesus said, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. He said, I only do what he says. I only, I only do what, what uh, um, I only say what, he, uh, what, he, uh, what I hear. I hear him say to me. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what does Jesus look like? He looks like perfect, unfailing love. But what we, ask to, what we have to ask ourselves, how did Jesus express love uh, uh, or, or what was Jesus' example of love in action? And here's what I found, you guys, as I study, and I love the Gospels. I read the Gospels over and over. I never stop reading the Gospels. I'm continually reading the Gospels. I'm always reading the red, uh, reading how Jesus did it, how he lived his life, because he didn't come as a superstar. He came to show us the way, how to this, live this life, life and how to be victorious. And so he came as an example. And when you, when you read the Gospels and you understand that, we can and ask God to make us like you. He will, because he lives in us. His kingdom is inside of us. The Holy Spirit is inside of us. His word is inside of us. And we've got to have his love inside of us to make it all complete. And so, so how did Jesus express love? And here's what I found. Jesus never called out sin. Did you know that? He ministered to a lot of people, a lot of broken, uh, broken, hurting people. But he never focused on their sin. But he looked past their sin and found treasure inside of them. Did you know everyone has treasure inside of them? Even those people that are that are wreaking havoc right now, causing problems. These crooks, <laughs> these people that you don't like, 
are they're hard to get along with. They have treasure inside of them. And Jesus never focused on their sin, but he looked deeper. He saw the treasure, and he pulled out that treasure, and they became what Jesus saw. See, that's the love anointing. And so, Jesus never came into agreement with what the accuser says or sees. And we should never come into agreement with what the Redeemer says and sees. Brokenness, sin, you know, guilt, shame, condemnation. All the bad things that are on people. We shouldn't come into agreement with that. But we should come into agreement with what the Redeemer says and sees. See, people already know there's something wrong with them. And so pointing it out, it's not going to do any good. But they have no idea that they have treasure in them. And you know, Jesus was a treasure hunter. And he called us to be treasure hunters. Don't focus on people's sin. That's a spirit of legalism, a spirit of religion, coming into agreement with the enemy. We want to come into agreement with the Lord, with the Redeemer, the one who transforms us, the God of second beginnings, the God that reveals the treasure in every person. And if we get the eyes of Jesus, and only we can do that is when we get the love anointing, I want to tell you something, watch out. This is how revival starts. That's transformation. That's revival. Let me give you some examples of love in action Jesus, from Jesus. <laughs> you remember the story um, of the Samaritan woman at the well? Jesus and the disciples are on a long journey, and they're traveling through Samaria, and they stop to rest at Jacob's well outside of this small town. And Jesus sends the disciples into town to get some food. But Jesus stayed because he knew he's going to about to have a divine appointment that was going to rock that town. See, his ways of evangelizing is so different than ours. And so Jesus is sitting there by himself, and all of a sudden a woman comes down carrying a jug, a water jug. And there's some commentaries that say that this woman was a prostitute. And she was an outcast. And because she was an outcast, she couldn't come and get water with all the rest of the women when they all gathered together to get water. She had to come at a s separate time. And so she comes down and she sees Jesus, a Jewish man. And Jesus sees her and Jesus asks, Will you give me a drink? <laughs> Can you believe that? This woman goes, hey, you know, Samaritans are Jews. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't associate, <laughs> you know. And Jesus said, if you knew who I am, you would be asking me for, for water. <laughs> and I'd give you living water. You'll never thirst again. And she says, give me that water. <laughs> and then Jesus begins to see her, begins to read her mail. He sees her her sin, but he didn't focus on the sin. He says, he goes, go get your husband. And she goes, I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. And she goes, I see you're a prophet. And so Jesus begins to prophesy to her and begins to call out treasure. See, Jesus looked past her sin, and he saw an evangelist. And begin to pull that out of her. Change her identity on the spot. What an encounter with Jesus, you guys, is all it takes. 
She's having an encounter with Jesus. Her eyes are open. Jesus is loving on her, not condemning her. And as Jesus was loving on her, all this guilt, shame, condemnation is coming off of her. She gets excited, and she realizes she doesn't have to live this old lifestyle. And she became what Jesus saw. She drops her water jug, forgot all about getting water, runs into town, and begins telling everybody. The town outcast is now the town evangelist, and starts telling everybody about Jesus. Come and see that. Could he be the Messiah? He told me everything about my life. And the Bible tells us she led almost the entire town to Jesus that day. One encounter with Jesus radically changed her life. Come on. That's the love anointing. Jesus didn't go to start preaching in the town. He took the, 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 the worst sinner in the town. And transformed her life. And she did the work. She led them all to Jesus. Isn't that cool? And the people wanted him to stay. He stood, stayed two more days. And there was a revival in that town. Come on. See how it works? See how the love anointing works? See, a spirit of religion would have said, Hey, you're, you're, you're a prostitute. You're unclean. You need to get your life right. You need to give, you, you need to repent. <laughs> And come to Jesus. Jesus came to her. Encountered her. And radically, wonderfully changed her life. And gave her a new identity. Gave her new beginnings. A new destiny. You know, think about it. I mean, there's so many. There's hundreds of stories like this. But another one that I, I really, really like also, it's crazy. Uh, Jesus and the disciples are going across the lake, and they're go Jesus wanted to go and evangelize a region that has not had the gospel. And when he gets to the, to the other side, the other shore, he was met by a demoniac. He had a legion of demons in him. That's a lot. Can you imagine the sin he must have been in to open a door to get a whole legion of demons inside? Can you imagine what kind of sin what he was into? He would hang out in, in the tombs, naked, howling at the moon, <laughs> cutting himself. Nobody could subdue him. They tried with chains and, and, and uh, uh, brackets and, and uh, what do you call those? Shackles, yeah, shackles. <laughs> but he would rip them apart. He would tear them apart. Nobody could sub subdue him. And right when Jesus got out of the boat, this man sees him and comes running and, and, and bows down before him. And he said, these demons started talking out of him. and said, did you come to destroy us? Well, basically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, Jesus cast out those, those demons, that legion. They went into a herd of pigs, hundreds of pigs. And those pigs ran off the hill and drowned in the water. And those, those uh, pig keepers, or what do you want to call them, were blown away. This is I can't believe this. And they ran into town and said, you guys, this is what's happening. You know that demoniac? You know, you know all those pigs we used to have? <laughs> and so the town comes out to see what happened. And when they get where Jesus was, they see this man, this, this former demoniac, dressed and in his right mind. And it says they were afraid. Now, they weren't afraid when he was hell at the moon naked, cutting himself and, <clears throat> you know, but when they see him in his right mind, they were afraid. And they asked Jesus to leave. Jesus only goes where he's invited. Where he's wanted. And I know he's wanted here in this place. That the former demoniac said to Jesus while he was leaving, he goes, can I go with you, please? He was begging Jesus, can I go with you? You did so much for me. You changed my life. 
You forgave my sins. You healed me. You delivered me. You gave me a new beginning, a new start. I'm transformed. Can I go with you? And he said, Jesus says to him, go back to your family. Go back to your town and tell the people how much God has done for you. And you know what he did? He became the town evangelist. The town demoniac became the town evangelist. Come on. That's the love anointing. Jesus looked past his sin, found treasure, pulled out the treasure, and he became who Jesus saw. And I was reading commentaries. I can't remember where it was, but they say there was probably about 4,000 people received Christ without Jesus being there through this demoniac that became the evangelist. How does God see you? How does he see you? How does he see your neighbor? Could your neighbor be the next Billy Graham that doesn't know, you know, who's inside of him? Love in action. Love looks like something. Love looks like Jesus. Jesus looks like the Father. And we look just like him. If we walk, if we choose to walk in this love anointing, it's a choice. It's not natural. It's something that has to grow. You've got to want it. Do you want revival? Are you looking for a mighty move of God? We've got to get God inside of us. We, well, I've got to, I have the Lord in me. Yeah, but do you have the love anointing? Do you know if God can trust you with his love, then he'll trust you with his power. If he can trust you with your love, with his love, he'll trust you with his anointing. If he can trust you with his love, he can trust you with his finances. And it goes on and on and on. It's all about love, people. The Beatles were right. All you need is love. They were prophesying and didn't realize it. Another example. You guys like examples? <laughs> I just love the Gospels, man. This is, they're so cool. Jesus was so cool. <clears throat> Jesus and his disciples. How would you have liked to have been one of Jesus' disciples hanging out with Jesus? Never a dull moment. Jesus and the disciples are walking through a town and all these people gathered around him and they're trying to make, make his way through the town and, uh, and there was a little short guy named Zacchaeus and uh, uh, he was a, a tax collector. He was a very dishonest man. He would collect more than was due to gain wealth and he was a very wealthy man. Despised, nobody liked Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus heard about Jesus, heard about the miracles, heard about his teaching. This guy walked on water. All the miracles. He raised the dead. And he hears about Jesus. And now Jesus is in his town. And so him, being a short guy, couldn't see over the crowd to get a good look at Jesus. So he runs ahead of the crowd, climbs up a sycamore fig tree, and he waits to Jesus to get a good look at Jesus. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> and when Jesus gets to where he is, Jesus looked up and saw Zacchaeus. He locked eyes with Zacchaeus. Those pools of love locked eyes with Zacchaeus. See, Jesus looked past his sin past his brokenness, past all the evil that he's done, and he saw a generous man. And he said, Zacchaeus, with these loving eyes, he says, I must come to your house. Isn't that cool? Instantly, Zacchaeus has an encounter. Jesus looked past his sin, found treasure, pulled out the treasure, and instantly, Jesus, uh, Zacchaeus became who Jesus saw. 
And here's what Zacchaeus said. He said, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pack, pay him back four times the amount. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, today, salvation has come to your house. He didn't call out sin. He pulled out treasure. People, that's the love anointing. Zacchaeus was transformed. He had an encounter with Jesus. He had an encounter with love, perfect love, unfailing love, that doesn't come into agreement with the accuser, but comes into agreement with the Redeemer. And he stepped into new beginnings, a new man, a generous man. Now his life made sense. He knew who he was. And he understood the value, the gift of giving instead of stealing. Jesus never mentioned his sin. Sometimes I get excited when I read the Gospels. I go, man, this is so cool. <laughs> One love encounter changed their lives. And again, this is transformation. This is revival. And I love it. I so love it that God is the God of second chances. He's the God of new beginnings. And he doesn't look at your sins right now. If any of you are struggling with anything, you know what the, the devil's greatest, his greatest uh, weapons are, are guilt, shame, and condemnation. God will never put that on you. Jesus would never put that on you. It's the devil. And if the devil can keep you in that, he can take your life and, and, and keep you from moving on with what God has for you. you. Jesus understands the broken world we live in, the fallen world. He understands that people need to know there's more. There's something inside of us that needs to come out. And so we have to identify that. And, and the Lord, if you have that love anointing, I, I promise you, God will show you what's inside people. And sometimes it's the worst guy in town. <laughs> you know, think about unstable Peter. Jesus called him a rock. <sighs> Murderous Saul. Jesus changed his name to the Apostle Paul. Fearful Gideon. God saw a mighty warrior of valor. David's outcasts of rejects, misfits, became David's mighty men. Undefeated. Victorious. How does God see you? How does he see your neighbor? See, this wasn't how they were in the natural. But they had treasure in them they didn't know about. Did you know that our words create? Do you know our words plant seeds? They really do. When you have that love anointing and you say something nice or good to somebody that's treating you bad, or somebody that's in sin, you can plant the seed. And I, I promise you, any seed that God gives you will never go bad. It will always sprout. I remember when Lori and I first got saved, <coughs> we were attending a little church. And, um, and I, you know, I just got to be honest with you. I, I came from a background. I was a hippie. I'm just going to tell you. I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I know we used to sell drugs. We did drugs. We, uh, uh, we, we uh, I, I had a ranch that we were leasing, me and a couple roommates, and we were growing marijuana, and, and uh, we would, I would have these uh, Woodstock parties that would start, man, they would start on a Friday night, 
and go all the way till Sunday night. We built a bandstand. We have nonstop bands, and people would be camping out there, and it just it was wild. Today, I'd still be in prison. <laughs> but, but then, you know, you could get away with those kinds of things. We were so far out in the country. Uh, but that's my life. And uh, and anyway, when we we gave our lives to the Lord in 1980, and um, we started attending this little church. And this one prophetess lady came to us as we were leaving the church. She said, "God." told me to come to you, and, and she's looking at me, and she said, you know what? God told me that you're going to be a minister, and you're going to have a ministry. And Lori couldn't contain herself. She busted out laughing. Honest. She laughed. She goes, that's impossible. You don't know this guy. <laughs> I'm like the least likely guy to ever, ever be a minister. <laughs> and so I didn't take it serious, and she definitely didn't take it serious. But I think that but there was a seed that was planted. You know, and I thought about that word. And I think, I'm not qualified. You know, I mean, why would God want a guy like me? You know, so many people that are, are, so, are, are far more, you know, better than me, more qualified. He wouldn't want me. But I want to tell you something. I think it was about 15 years later. Maybe was it 20 years later? or 50, I forget what it was. But all of a sudden, the Lord started moving on me. And we started going to all these training conferences. And the Holy Spirit kept coming upon me. And then we, uh, we got involved with the Toronto outpouring. And we were there all the time. We were on the, the visiting um, ministry team. And then I spent uh, the whole summer in Toronto uh, in, the, in the middle of the outpouring at the, at the International Leader School of Ministry. And you know, when the power of God, when I, as I was being saturated in this love, the Father's love, it was all about the Father's love. This love is coming over me. I just started seeing treasure in everybody. And I began to prophesy to everybody. I was, I was a prophesying, I was going to say fool, but <laughs> uh, machine. machine. Yeah, that's better. And I, there was so much power. Yeah, I just barely touched something, they would fall down. Why? Because I was with love, perfect unfailing love. People were getting healed. People were getting delivered. And out of that, uh, myself and a, and a um, pastor named Ralph Cassera, uh, Toronto sent us out to uh, catch the fire conferences all over Europe. And all of a sudden, I'm launched into ministry. Wasn't even looking for it. I was blindsided by it. And then we came back, and out of that, uh, the healing room's ministry was birthed out of that. And what we're doing today, our big apostolic center, it was all birthed out of an encounter with Jesus, out of the Father's love. It was all about love. And love did it. Yeah. People, it was love. It was love. I had an encounter with love. I'm not qualified to do this ministry. Still today, I just think, God, what were you thinking? <laughs> but I had an encounter with love. See, when love comes on you like that, and he begins to pull the treasure out of you that you don't know it's there, all of a sudden you're, you're, you're successful. In the natural, I, I couldn't do anything. But when I'm filled with love and he trusts me with his love, when I'm loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I'm loving other people and seeing them through God's eyes, all of a sudden things begin to shake. Things begin to happen. Things begin to build. Favor comes upon you. Why? Because you're representing him. Something you can't do on your own. I'm preaching. I was going to teach. I was, I was going to, I was going to teach. And I, sometimes it's so hard. You know, a spirit of religion. Or I don't say spirit of religion. I just say the word religion is only mentioned five times in the Bible. Did you know that? In the entire Bible, religion is only men uh, mentioned five times. And you know what's really cool too? The only people Jesus slammed or came against was the religious. Right. You know, he was accused of being a friend of sinners. He said, it's, it's, I, didn't come, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the lost. The sick need a doctor, not the ones that are well. He was the friend of sinners. And he's still a friend of sinners. And the thing, he doesn't condemn them. He loves them into the kingdom. He transforms them into the kingdom. 
people, we got to get this right. We got to do it right. A love, well, let me get back to this. Religion is, is only five times mentioned in the Bible. Sin is mentioned 400 times. But love is mentioned 551 times. So you can tell what, is, what the priority is for the Lord. A love rela- relationship with God is the main theme in the Bible. That's it. It's all about love. All you need is love. Katie, you've you got to start singing that. <laughs> yeah. Galatians 5, 6. It says this, and I love this. The only thing that counts, there's only one thing that counts, you guys. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's the only thing that counts. You can have faith but not have love. That doesn't count. <laughs> you know, you're not going to have the results. As if you have love and faith coupled, watch out. You'll be an earth shaker, a fire starter, a revivalist. The Bible tells us love is the highest commandment. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Love builds up. If you're tearing people down with your words, that's not love. Again, our words create. Our words have power. You know, we've been all over the world, and we've seen miracles in the atmosphere. And uh, when we go traveling, and doing conference around the world, you know, I don't lay hands on anybody. I'll bring a team with me because I don't want people, everyone's prayer from the, from the you know, from the, uh, the head dude. <laughs> I don't know what to call myself. But, um, but we've seen extreme miracles. And I've seen literally blind eyes, people born blind healed by just releasing a word that creates I've seen people come out of stretchers paralyzed. But when you're operating in the love anointing, it activates the angels. I remember when we were in Spokane at the Spiritual Hunger Conference a while back, probably about 3,000 people. And I was preaching, I was teaching, and, and all of a sudden I get a word of knowledge right in the middle of the message. And I... I remember I said, I said, there's somebody here who had cancer in your sinuses. You went through radiation and it, it caused your salivatory glands to dry up. You have to use artificial saliva. And that's a weird one, isn't it? <laughs> and all that big, huge crowd. Now, all of a sudden, I see a vortex, a swirl. And I see those every once in a while. I know those are angels. I see a swirl. And it, and it landed right in the middle of the crowd. And it landed and it hit this lady. And this lady started screaming. And, and, and she go, bam, and, and that was her. And she got completely, wonderfully, perfectly healed. Oh. See, our words create, but also uh, we work, we partner with angels. And there's a lot of angels here, you guys. We need to start partnering with them, recognize them, acknowledging them, and asking them to assist you. Hebrews says that angels are ministering spirits. They say they're sent to minister to us and with us. And in Psalms 104, you know, that's the benefit chapter, it talks about angels. It, let me just read that real quick. I am all over the place today. We love it. Psalms 103. Talking about angels, it says in, uh, in, verse 20, in verse 20, it says, Praise the Lord, you his angels. And it goes on to say, you mighty ones. Did you know angels are mighty? Yes. Yes. 
They're not little babies with wings floating on a cloud playing a harp. But it says, who do his bidding. Other translations say, uh, 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 anyway, who obey the voice of his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts who do his will. So when you're partnering in the glory, we have the love anointing, you get a word of knowledge, there's an angel right there doing God's bidding, obeying the voice of the Lord. And they're searching. Now I've seen people, I've had, I've had probably a dozen people that do see angels, and when I'm up preaching, they see an angel with his hand on my back, it's a big one, and he's panning, constantly panning the audience. And so when he drops, God drops a word of knowledge, and I give voice to that word, it sets the angel on assignment to accomplish what was just spoken. And I've seen extreme miracles. Miracles I wouldn't have faith for, honest to God, laying hands on and praying for them. But then when it's a word of knowledge like that, it's in the, in the love anointing, understanding. I understand I, I minister with angels. You know, this is not an automatic. I can't, I just can't make it just happen. But when, you can tell when the anointing is there. Now the glory is there and God wants to do that. I've seen extreme miracles. And you know what I love about it? God gets all the credit. I don't get the credit. I'm just, I, just, I, just, I just said the word. It wasn't my word, it was his word. I didn't heal the person. That angel went and did the job. I was just obedient to his word. He trusted me. Why? Because I love him and I love the people. It's the love anointing, you guys. You guys got me preaching, you know. I was, gonna, I was supposed to teach today. So, in closing, I think, we need to daily, or at least weekly, Take the love test. How do we know if we're walking in love? How do we know? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks all about that. And it says at the, in the last verse of, um, of chapter 12, it says, and now I will show you the most excellent way how many want the most excellent way? How you, there's many ways, you guys, you can minister. But there's one way that's the most excellent way. And he goes on to say, Paul goes on to say, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have the faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I'm, I gain nothing. And then he begins to describe what love is, but equally important what love is not. And he goes on to say, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not uh, uh, easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. That's a biggie right there, you guys. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trust, always hopes, and always perseveres. He says, love never fails. We had a woman come into our healing rooms a while back, and she was in extreme pain in her neck, her back, and her shoulder. She was crying. She was a young woman, probably in her late 20s. But you can tell by the way she looked that she was not a Christian at all. 
you know, and, and she, the way she dressed, the way she looked, you know, just her demeanor. You knew she, she did not know God. But she was just at the ER. And uh, they could do nothing for her. They did, ran all kinds of tests, could find nothing wrong with her. Nothing wrong. They gave her medication, pain medication, and it did not help. And so they were re 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 releasing her. And she goes, what am I going to do? I'm in so much pain. What am I going to do? I don't know what to do. And one of the nurses said, you need to go to the healing rooms. Oh, you know, doctors and, and nurses have heard about the healing rooms because they can't do God is doing in the healing rooms. We know we have doctors all the way from UCLA Medical Center sending patients to us. We've had two doctors from the Bay Area both with stage four cancer, heard about us, came and both got healed. Yeah. You know, yeah. see doctors operate in the natural. <laughs> They're not trained, you know, how to deal with, with, with the uh, soul and the spiritual issues. Well, this woman comes in crying. She's in so much pain. And uh, I asked the Lord, Lord, how do I even pray for this woman? And the Lord just said, just love on her. We could tell she's a very sinful woman, but we asked the Lord to show us what you see. And when I laid my hand on her shoulder, instantly the Lord started to show me when she was a young girl, all the way up into her teens, what she wanted more than anything, to have a family, to have a husband and have kids and have a home, being financially secure, you know, and she went down a different path, you can just tell, and I, she didn't have anything. And she was under so much stress and so, under so much sh uh, shame and so much guilt. And so we just started telling her, I started telling her, you know, God really loves you. That's the love anointing. I plan to say, firstly, God really loves you. And he says that he's going to give you your heart's desire. He has that husband for you. He's got the kids you've always wanted. I see a house with a white picket fence. And I see you driving a very nice car. God's got some wonderful things for you. And as, as we were prophesying to her about God's love and how God sees her, and there were some personal things, but it's all good, nothing bad, uh, demons were flying off her. Just, wow, 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 they're coming off of her. And all of her pain instantly leaves. She had an encounter with love. She had a love encounter. And she goes, oh, my pain is gone. I feel completely different. All the heaviness has left me. I got to know this Jesus. I got to know this God. So we, we led her to the Lord. And she walked out of there a new person. She didn't look like the same person. Her countenance changed completely. And she went out of there just floating, you know, uh, See, that's the love anointing, you guys. You know, a spirit of religion said, well, you need to get your act together. We can see you're, you're into some bad stuff. <laughs> you know, you need to repent, man. No, we didn't do that. We looked deep, saw treasure, began to pull out the treasure. And it healed her. Are you guys getting this? Yeah. Let me just close. I got two, just... Just two more scriptures. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 14 through 14, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other, and forgive whatever grievances you, uh, you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. So love is the binding agent for all these virtues, you guys. Without the love, we can't, they can't be bound together. And I could preach on that, but I'm not going to. I don't have time. But Next time. Yeah. In 1 John 4, 7 through 12, 
It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who has been born of God and knows God, did I write that? Everyone who loves has been born of God, excuse me, and, and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might have, we might have life, we might live through him. And this love, and this is love, is not the love. This is, excuse me, this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made perfect in us. And then, uh, and then it goes on in verse 16 through 21. It's so good, it says, God is love. And it keeps repeating, God is love. Love is a person. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God. Come on. Yeah. And God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. See, that's what makes us like him. You guys, it's the love anointing. And there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If, it, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. There's so much. But I really feel the key how many know in, in the kingdom, there's many keys? Remember, Jesus, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. And there's keys that will unlock different doors in heaven, whatever we need. Sometimes it's evangelism. He'll give us the key to evangelism. Or sometimes, you know, it's for healing. Or, or to give somebody an encouraging word. He'll give us the key. You know, our apostolic center is big. We have lots of offices, lots of rooms, and lots of closets. And each one has a separate key but I have the master key. <laughs> and I could get into any door, any office, any closet I want, because I got the master key. And the Lord told me that love is the master key. That will unlock any part of heaven you need to get into. Any door in heaven will open if you have the master key. And that master key is love. God is love. It's the love anointing, you guys. The two greatest commandments. Oh, love is alive. Love is living. It's real. It's powerful. It's anointed. We must pursue love. Make the choice. I'm going to love. I'm going I'm to pray every day. I'll see people through God's eyes. And I'll plant seeds. I'll pull out treasure. That's revival. That's what revival looks like. Let's pray. Lord, we want to just thank you for your word. But I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came to show us the way, how to be successful in anything and everything in our lives. We, we put our will to. Lord, I'm asking right now, Lord, put your love anointing in all of us. Just put your hand on your heart. Lord, we truly want to represent you perfectly as you perfectly love the Father. Lord, we ask, Lord, for the love anointing to come upon us. Give us new eyes. Let us constantly be aware, Lord, of what you see in people, the treasure, the gold inside of people. Let us never get, let us come into agreement with what the accuser says and sees. Let us never walk in the spirit of legalism or, or religion, Lord. But, Lord, let us walk in the love in perfect, unfailing love. Lord, we pray this 
And you know what else happens when we walk in this love? We, we begin to look like God. And, you know, we begin to look like Jesus. You know, Jesus is the light of the world. And when we have this love, we begin to radiate. We begin to shine. And people will come to you and say, you're shining. What is that on you? There's light coming off of you. You don't have to say anything. People are attracted to you. They come to you because, because this love is light. And, and, and they'll come to you and want to be near you and ask you, what is it about you? Would you say it's God, it's love. He loves you so much. Lord, I pray that the light of your love would rest upon all of us. Lord, we pray, Lord, we'd go, go to sleep at night in your love, wake up in the morning with fresh oil <laughs> and fresh fire every single day. Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I want to thank you for the revival that's coming. Lord, I want to thank you for the revival that's going to happen right here in this room. And I really see it, you guys. There's a revival. You know, if this, if this ministry wasn't here in Atascadero, this, this city wouldn't be the same. You're, you guys are making a difference in your city, if, whether you know it or not. This ministry is impacting. The glory that's on this building is, 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 is all over. It, it's making a difference in, in, in uh, the North Coast, North County. And so, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done all that you're currently doing, and all that you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.